Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the college admissions process podcast. I am your host, John Durante. And I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insights straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions, regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given podcast episode you should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.com collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am very excited about today's episode as it is the kickoff to a series of podcasts related to helping aspiring student athletes and their families through every step of the recruitment process. Today's guest is someone I've known for over 20 years and I can assure you that I've seen him work firsthand with his athletes and their families to help them through every step of the college recruitment process. The list of schools his athletes have played for, and in many cases are still playing for, is quite impressive as they include Duke, Yale, Harvard, Brown, John Hopkins, the University of Maryland, Stony Brook, and too many others to mention. He has guided over an astounding 170 student athletes and their families through the recruitment process to 48 different colleges and universities throughout the United States from 2001 to today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Syosset High School's boys varsity lacrosse coach, John Calabria. John, how are you doing today? Pretty good, Dr. Durante. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, it's our pleasure, John. I really appreciate your time, and I'm looking forward to this conversation, as I know it's going to help a lot of aspiring student athletes and their families. So, John, why don't we start by asking you to just take a moment, tell us about yourself, and what has been your journey related to coaching? Yeah, that's um, that's that's definitely, it, it's been a while. I'm getting old now, so, you know, I can't believe uh, <laughs> uh, that I've been at Syosset for, this is my 23rd year. Uh, at Syosset, 22nd year as head coach, and uh, it's it's definitely been a journey. So I started um, at Sachem High School out east, Long Island, and um, I was a football guy. You know, I, I didn't uh, really really play lacrosse. You know, lacrosse was just something that, um, you know, we were kind of forced into doing by our football coach, and it was really football forced us into wrestling, and then the wrestling coach said, well, you got to do something, so we – we, the wrestling coach said, why don't you play lacrosse? And they were kind of all the same coaches with, you know, mixed in with the sports, uh, who was the head coach, who was the assistant coach. So I've had a lot of, uh, I had a lot of coaches influence me very early on, you know, right from, from middle school, um, in the Sachem school district. Uh, they, uh, it was a tremendous amount of, of, um, of influence. I mean, you know, back in those days, it wasn't like it is today where the parents take you to practice and come stay at practice. My parents were never really around or anything like that. They were, um, you know, they dropped you off and then that was it. And the coaches kind of handled you and, and dealt with you. And, um, you know, I was always a three sport athlete at Sachem. And, um, you know, like I said, I was a football guy and uh, I was going to play big time division one football. And then from there I was going to play in the NFL. That's what I thought I was going to do. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that dream kind of died, I would say, in 10th grade or 11th grade. And, you know, it was time to start thinking about college. Um, I had made a team called the 
the the Empire State Games team. That was a program that was run by New York State. Uh, it was defunded in 2009, actually. Uh, but uh, my young life growing up, it was the recru- the only recruiting tool. And, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff later. But um, in lacrosse, it was really the only recruiting tool. And, and I was lucky enough to be on the team in 1987. And, you know, like I said, at that point, the the NFL dreams were uh, were going out the window and the div- big time division one football dreams were going out the window and um, to start, decided to, you know, really think about playing lacrosse in college, y- you know, just uh, along those same lines, very uh, unlike Syosset High School and a lot of Long Island high schools today. I think about 20 percent of Sachem High School at the time actually went on to college. And out of that 20 percent, it was like 80 percent went for sports you know uh, kids just didn't uh, just graduate from high school and and go to college for you know it was very small percentage so uh, if you wanted to you know go to college you know that was that was something you you needed to kind of find it you know what you wanted to do and i wasn't sold on it you know i was driving a tractor trailer at the time 17 years old my dad owned a trucking company and i was i was driving a tractor trailer uh in the summers and after school believe it or not, uh, after practice. And um, I wasn't really thinking about college or, or even going to college. It wasn't something that was really on my radar. And in August, after I graduated from high school, I got a phone call from a man named Paul Doherty. Uh, Doc Doherty was the uh, head coach at um, Adelphi University. And Paul actually just passed away this year. Um, oh, so sorry to hear that, John. Yeah, no, he lived, he lived a, a very long life, uh, but, um, he, uh, he called me up middle of, middle of August and said, you know, if you want, you can come play lacrosse at Adelphi, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for you to come. And, you know, my parents didn't have any money to send us to college. So, uh, you know, coach was, was, uh, had seen me play a couple of times and, um, had offered me a scholarship and I wound up going to Adelphi. Um, you know, my first couple of years at Adelphi were a rocky road. Like I said, I was still driving a truck. Um, I had a second job at that time uh, in auto repair. I was I was doing brake jobs and tune ups and exhausts on cars for a local guy in Garden City, and um, it was a rocky road. And my coach, uh, the assistant coach, his name was Kevin Sheehan. Kevin asked me to work a lacrosse camp. And he put me in charge of the third grade kids. I was the last guy you wanted to be in charge of little kids, you know, because I was very rough around the edges. I grew up, you know, and my mother's an Irish immigrant. My father's an Italian immigrant. And uh, um, I was a truck driver. So putting me in charge of third graders was like the last thing you wanted to do. But I I, I, I found a real... Um, that's where I, that's where I wanted to become a teacher. You know, when that summer, when, when coach Sheehan asked me to work the lacrosse camp and start teaching kids how to play lacrosse, I kind of found, you know, my love for teaching and my love for coaching. And, um, that summer and the summer following, now I'm a junior. Uh, I really took control of my education, uh, took control of the lacrosse camps that they had asked me to work. And, uh, I was working a couple of different ones now because I really enjoy it. And from there, graduated from Adelphi. Uh, there was a new head coach. His name was Sandy Capitos. We were lucky enough you know, to win a national championship. And I was lucky enough to be an All-American while I was at it um, as an attackman there. And we, uh, we beat CW Post in national championship. We graduated and coach had asked me to be the graduate assistant. So I, my coaching career started at Adelphi as a graduate assistant, you know, along with those lacrosse camps that I was doing over the summer. And at that point, um, I got my master's in teaching. Uh, I had enough credits. I actually graduated with a business administration degree, uh, but I always loved history. So I had enough history credits uh, with, the, with the secondary education uh, degree. I became a soul studies teacher. And I worked at a school in Corona, Queens, uh, called the School of the Transfiguration. It was a private school in Corona, Queens. 
And at that time, that was my second year at Adelphi as the graduate assistant, first year working as a teacher, uh, finishing up my master's, I was offered the head coaching job at Queens College. So Queens College was, was an interesting place. They had about 12 kids on the team at the time, and they needed someone to come in with a lot of connections to recruit. And um, it, it didn't work out so well. It was very difficult to get um, uh, kids that really wanted to get into Queens, uh, to come to Queens College to play, because it was, it, was it was a very difficult school to get into. So not only did you need good lacrosse players, but you needed them to be very, very intelligent, and they weren't taking anyone really with, you know, with a very high GPA. So it was very difficult to recruit. We didn't do so well my first year, and um, because of Title IX, and we were the program that was struggling the most, they decided to end boys lacrosse at Queens College. Oh, wow. Yeah. So. You know that was that was kind of a you know your first head coaching position. Every you know everyone always said you always have to take your first head coaching position offer regardless of where it is. So, you know it wasn't something that I, looking back, it was definitely not something that I was ready for. Um, I didn't know, really know anything about the college recruiting process other than the kids that were at Adelphi and my own re- recruiting situation, which was very very different. And it was already, the, the process was already starting to change. We're talking 1998 right now. And it was already going to, um, you know, going through a, a growing pains process of, of changing into the new culture of recruiting. So right around uh, that year, uh, when, when Queens uh, killed their program, went through the rest of that spring, I uh, did not coach, worked a couple of lacrosse camps, and then um, I got an interview at Syosset High School with two gentlemen, Al Yanisi and Rich Collins. Oh, uh, legends. Right? Legends <laughs> Great people. in every sense of the word. <laughs> had, um, you know, had called me in. The, the Two days previous to that, someone told me, I, I can't even remember who it was, if you want a teaching job, you have to go. There was no OLAS. There was nothing like that. If you want a teaching job, you have to go and in, walk into high schools and hand the principal your resume. So I walked into Sanhassen <laughs> High School two days previous, and George Schneider pulled me into the office and said, sit down here and let's go over your resume, just like that. I don't know what he was doing, but he dropped everything he was doing. He just happened to have a minute. And, <laughs> and it, it, you know, John, you know better than anyone. George loves stuff like that, stuff that was just – you know, we were actually in his office, but he loved to get out of his office and just do stuff, you know, like that. So he spoke to me, spoke to me for about five minutes and then must have handed my resume off. The person who had the job, the social studies position at Syosset left to be an administrator in the middle of August now. So they had um, interviewed me. I was lucky enough to get the job there. Um, and I met a man the first week on the job orient uh you know teacher orientation new teacher orientation i met a man by the name of john pappas and as you know john you know recently passed away uh another another guy lived into his 80s had a great life you know um uh john pulled me in and he said you you were you were an all-american in in college and and you uh won a national championship and you know uh your coach, you have coaching experience. And he said, you're going to be the freshman football coach here. And um, at the time, Syosset had three teams at Syosset High School, three teams, varsity, JV, and a freshman team. And uh, that's when I started my coaching career at Syosset with the freshman team. Uh, that year, I also coached wrestling. And then uh, Jeff Capri was the head um, uh, lacrosse coach. And he said, that I, you know, be more than welcome to coach the freshman lacrosse team. So that was uh, 2000, uh, 1999 to 2000 was uh, my first year at Syosset, and I was the freshman lacrosse coach. And um, the freshman teams struggled because most of them didn't have schedules in Nassau, so we had to play Suffolk teams. It was both football and lacrosse, and uh, we struggled in the wins and loss column because those teams just had better numbers, um, you know, one thing about Syosset is we were never blessed. We still are not blessed with tremendous athletic ability that, um, some of the other schools, Massapequa, Farmingdale, and some of the other uh, towns have, 
but um, nonetheless, it was a great experience and, and working under Jeff, you know, was a tremendous experience. Jeff was putting together a, a great program at SIAS. It had all the foundations for a great program. And then that very next year, you know, Jeff had decided to step down and I, I took over, you know, Pappas had, uh, John Pappas called me in and he said, we'd like you to take over the whole program. And, you know, to be honest with you, looking back, I really wasn't ready for that job either. You know, <laughs> uh, that was something that was a tremendous undertaking. And, um, you know, for the last 22 years, it's, uh, it's defined me. I've made it part of my family is part. My personal family is part of, um, you know, the Sayas at the cross family. I have over these years, I've had managed to have four children. My wife hasn't thrown me out of the house yet. And, um, <laughs> you know, if you know anything, every coach uh, that's listening to this, that will listen to this, knows that when you're in season, that's almost like uh, your wife is widowed for that season. You know, she has oh, to be just as much a part of it um, and be supportive uh, as uh, as dedicated as coaches are to their programs. The, the the women behind them have to really uh, support them because it, it wouldn't happen without them. You know, it's really been uh, it's been a fun ride. So um, over those years, you, you know, that's when I started making connections with college coaches, um, the governing body of lacrosse, U.S. lacrosse. Um, governs lacrosse throughout the country, high school across throughout the country and college across throughout the country. So I'm an area chairperson for U.S. lacrosse. Uh, and I'm also the president of the Nassau County Coaches Association. So through those organizations is where I've made all of, of my connections with the college coaches to be able to promote Syosset kids, but also to promote the kids of Nassau and now Suffolk County. I had mentioned earlier the Empire Games that I was lucky enough to be a part of, when they were defunded in 2009, the Nassau County Coaches Association and the Suffolk County Coaches Association has, has taken that and, and provided something called the Long Island Showcase, uh, where we showcase Nassau and Suffolk County kids to uh, participate and play in front of college coaches. So that's something that, that they've been able to uh, do and we've been able to keep going you know, even though, um, you know, New York state has kind of run out of funds for stuff like that. Well, John, that's a perfect example of why I've admired and watched you for, like I said, over 20 years. And I admire you because I've watched you help so many kids, so many families. Anytime you have to actually meet with coaches in the high school, you actually use my conference room. So I am uh, a witness to the great work that you do. So I want to thank you on behalf of all the kids in the past and all the kids in the future because you, my friend, are definitely someone that gives your all, um, many times puts his own family aside, like you mentioned, to help others. And uh, you're a true inspiration. Let me ask you a question, Thanks, John. John. Well, I mean it, and thank you know you. it. By the time the college coach gets to you, they already know that the athlete can play. What are some of the things that they are looking for from you? And could you give us any insight in terms of how those conversations go? Yeah, you know, that's a great question, John, because that is something that a lot of parents and, you know, I think maybe even some coaches don't, you know, don't realize about the college coaches. That When I say coaches, the high school coaches and parents don't realize that the, the college coaches, if they're calling me, they already have seen the young man, the young woman, if they're calling it one of the, you know, um, one of the, uh, the girl sports coaches, they've already seen them play. They've, that they, something piqued the interest. Now, nowadays that could be, uh, an online video that they saw on YouTube, uh, maybe something that the kid has sent to college coach, a million things, uh, could have piqued the interest of a college coach. But by the time they're calling a high school coach, it's not about, you know, can the kid play? How good is he or she? It's, it always stems around what kind of kid is the athlete? What are they like on a day-to-day -day basis? Are they the first one out to the field? 
What's going on in the classroom? What do their friends say about them? What's the family like? Um, that is, you know, really the only thing, any, in my opinion, that anyone can ever have is their character. And that's what that college coach uh, is almost always calling about. You know, once in a while, we'll get a co- I'll get a college coach that'll say, hey, we heard about your lefty attackman. Is, is he that good? Is, is, he, is he really 6'3"? Uh, you know, can he shoot 100 miles an hour? Stuff, maybe little things that they can't see on video or when they saw them once at a tournament or on the field. But I would say that's, that's maybe happened three times in my whole career. Every other time, it's about their character, what they're like in the classroom, again, what their friends say about them, what their teachers say about them, and more specifically, holistically, what, what's their family all about? What's the family dynamic? And, you know, and what they're trying to gauge is, you know, is the kid going to be a good fit for their program? You know, college coaches deal with and their livelihood is staked in the most irresponsible creature that walks the planet earth you know it's it's a kid between the ages of 18 and and 22 and their their livelihood is is you know rooted in that and they've got to make sure you know that that that's always the number one question because they can't have they can't be bringing in kids that that are messing with their livelihood you know i mean that that's really what it comes down to so yeah i mean and i and i just i just want to make sure that specifically parents understand that your coach is not going out and promoting your kid and saying hey look at my kid look how great he plays they kind of know that already you know and everyone knows who the the top players are now it's going to the x factor is going to be that next you know that character component in my opinion and that's what i've seen in my experience well that's great insight john thank you again i really appreciate it as i'm sure that many parents and aspiring student athletes do as well let me ask you john when a college coach reaches out to you they're either going to make the decision to recruit the student athlete or not what happens when a coach decides not to recruit a kid do you continue to push for that kid? Again, John, any insight into the process would be appreciated. Right. Um, yeah, I think, like you said, when the recruitment process starts and that first initial contact is made with the coach and, you know, the college coach is vetting the kid, um, you know, there's usually two roads. They, they, they're they're going to continue and they're going to figure out, you know, a way to offer this kid or they're not going to. And, you know, Many times, you know, for whatever reason, they're not going to continue with the recruitment process on a particular athlete. And that's a really important time in a kid's life because, you know, we all, every human being, right, at one point or another faces rejection, you know, not, they're not going to be, you know, moving forward and, and now you're rejected. So, so what do you do, you know, and, and that's really important to understand that, you know, a lot of times the parents will want the coach to, you know, well, look again, make, make, make them come back. You know, put, really, we really want to go to this particular school. We've got to figure out how to make that happen. Um, you know, and, and sometimes that can work. But, but, you know, in most cases, what we now need to do is really have the, the player, you know, depending on how involved his parents are, the family. Uh, reevaluate, reevalu- reevaluate their situation in that we maybe have to lower expectations academically. You know, maybe the reason the coach is not going to continue with recruitment is because he doesn't feel he can get him accepted because of his, you know, program of study, GPA. Maybe, you know, he just doesn't feel like it's going to be a good fit. Um, there have been times, you know, where kids have wound up somehow, some way pushing the situation where they wind up going to that school. And when I've seen that happen, the student athlete typically transfers, you know, it's typically something that they have to, you know, um, they're not ready to reevaluate their, their position academically or athletically. And, but they wind up having to do that anyway in a year or maybe a year and a half, maybe two years, but rarely is that going to work out uh, for, for a million reasons. But 
what what I have to do is really get that kid to understand, you know, it's not necessarily that they don't, you know, like you for any one particular reason, but you do have to reevaluate and reassess the situation to find the right school. Um, and that that's really going to be overarching um, to, to be one of the most important things that, that a student athlete finds the right fit. You don't want to force a bad situation like anything in life. You know, you don't want to be in that, in that environment. Well, as always, that's great advice. John, what can you tell us about the NCAA Clearinghouse in terms of their rules and anything else you want to share? I know that there's definitely been some changes over the last few years. So any insight, again, is greatly appreciated. Sure. I, I mean, so now, now we're going on the other fork in the road of, well, now the kid is going to, you know, go to a particular school and the coach moves forward with the recruitment. And, um, you know, now we're, we're moving into the area of the, the, the student athlete is going to commit. Um, we're not quite there yet, but they're, they're going to go through the, the vetting process of the NCAA. So any student athlete that plays in college, Division One, Two, Three, or junior college has to go through the NCAA clearinghouse. Now, you know, back in 1989, when I graduated from Sachem, um, that was signing a piece of paper when you walked onto campus uh, at Adelphi University. And that was the end of it, you know. Um, interestingly enough, Adelphi, when I went, was Division One, And then after my sophomore year, we switched to Division II. Um, so, you know, and the same thing. We signed a piece of paper for the Division II, and then that was it. Now, obviously, it's very different, and it's online. So you simply go to ncaa.org, um, ncaa.org, and you register. Um, so that's easy enough to do. Now, what the what has to happen with regard to you being cleared is going to vary from state to state, from school to school. So um, I don't know how to say this. If you go to Syosset High School, as a coach of a recruited athlete, here's what I say. I say, see your guidance counselor, literally those words, and then that is the end of it. The kids are completely taken care of from start to finish. I think that has to do with Chris Ruffini, the head of our guidance department and our guidance counselors, but it more so has to do with our courses at Syosset High School are set up and cleared by the NCAA as core courses and are checked off. That may not necessarily be the case at all schools. You will know once you register and you'll see on the on the portal, I happen to be familiar with it because I have two kids that one played division one and the other played division two. So I know the exact, my, my children, I mean, um, and I had to register and I could see what was approved and what was not approved. Um, you're familiar with the, we have something called a school or the alternative school at Syosset High School. Rich Collins, that gentleman I mentioned earlier, used to be the um, head of guidance. He actually had all of those courses for those boys cleared by the NCAA. There was a young man in 2000 named Nino, wound up going to Loyola to play lacrosse. He was a big time football player at Syosset. Um, yeah, I remember Nino really yeah, well. Yeah, <laughs> you remember Nino, right? And Nino couldn't get into any Division One school because he couldn't get through the clearinghouse. And Rich Collins had the courses approved that he was taking in the alternative school. You know, they were vetted by the NCAA and approved. Anyway, the point is, every high school would be different. I'm sure that, uh, you know, all high schools in New York w would be um, uh, cleared. But I would just recommend to parents, players... Make sure you get on the NCAA.org. Make sure that you're registering for the clearinghouse and making sure that your classes are approved and that you will go into school without without issue. There are a number of other things, John, that uh, have to be done. Medical, you need to have all kinds of different um, medical clearances. All, you know, upload, you upload everything um, from your doctor same, I think it's probably similar to what you have to do to go to public school in, in, in New York State, for example. You know, immunizations, different, a, a physical. What, what I, I'm not familiar with all of those things, but I do know when you go on NCAA.org and you register, it's going to walk you through step by step exactly how 
to do it, but you must do it regardless of any level. Well, that's great advice. And again, we appreciate it. And by the way, we'll put the links to the NCAA. And John, any other links that you want me to include in the show notes, I'm happy to provide it again to the aspiring student athletes and their families. In terms of scholarship money, how does that conversation begin between the coach, parents, and of course, the student athlete, John? Right. Um, that's a big deal. You know, college, uh, college tuition is is, you know, going up every year and um, very expensive. You know, it's a huge investment in, in uh, the kid's future and the family's future typically because, you know, everyone's, you know, got to be involved. Um, the short answer is when I help a kid and I walk a kid through the recruitment process, I, I don't get, like, I never see the dollar amount. I never, I never know what the, you know, how, uh, much money they get, but I do connect the the coach and the family with regard to a couple of things. So usually the first question on that is need. Um, you know, the coach will will ask a high school coach privately what what is the what what is the need? You know, d- does this family need money and things like that? So what I've developed over time, knowing that question is coming because I'm advocating for the, for this, this student athlete and the family. So I will say to them, you know, you know, flat out, I don't want to get into your personal finances, but what is your need? What, what, you know, what are, what are you looking at as far as, you know, um, this investment? And then from there, um, you know, the next question is how many different schools are recruiting the young man, the young woman? So essentially that's what scholarship money is based on those two things. So if, if 10 schools in the ACC are, you know what, if all of the schools in the, the ACC are recruiting Danny in 2003, and they were, Virginia had made Danny a scholarship offer, uh, Maryland at the time was in the ACC, they've switched to the Big Ten since, but they had offered, uh, North Carolina had money on the table for him, and when Duke came to the table, you know, they, they, they offered him a significant scholarship. Um, my job as, as the, as the, uh, the high school coach is just connecting, um, the family and the coach. Typically what happens is they set up a visit. You would come to campus unofficially and, um, the offer would typically be put, would be put on the table. I will say lately in lacrosse, now, now, just to be clear, a fully funded lacrosse program gets 12.6 full scholarships. That's 1.0. That is everything. That means you walk on the campus with your backpack and everything is taken care of. 1.0. I would say in my experience on a team, there would be maybe one to four kids on the team that have a full 1.0 scholarship. So you know, it, the other 8.6 would then be dispersed throughout the rest of the team. Okay. So if, if I'm right, okay. And Duke university today has the average four kids on full rides, 8.6 dispersed. Duke has 65 kids on their team right now today. So just to think about what scholarship, how much money are you going to get? Unless you're one of those top players in the class, um, you, you know, what kind of scholarship are you, are you really looking at? And some, some scholarships are $2,500 a year. Um, some scholarships are $30,000 a year and it depends on how they, how they, um, will manage it. That would be between the, the, the head coach and the parents. So just the parents that are listening, the players that are listening, the head coach of the, of the, the sport offers a scholarship. When you're talking about a commitment and you're talking to the assistant coach or position coach, they're not going to, they will never, you know, have the final word on the scholarship. The head coach will always have the final word. And um, that typically happens at a visit. Well, again, John, that's great advice and awesome insight. Really appreciate it. So after the college coach meets with the parents and the student athlete, what happens next, John? So now you're, you're moving into the final commitment. Um, phase of the recruitment, the, the scholarship will be offered and the student athlete will accept. 
Um, at that point, that's a big day, especially for these young kids today, because that's your Instagram day. You know, that's when you <laughs> you you commit, and uh, it gets to go on Instagram. Um, you know, it, speaking of which, I, I think you're going to be having some Ivy Leaguers come and speak uh, on the show. Uh, it, they'll talk to you about. You know, Ivy League schools don't offer scholarships. Uh, their commitment is a commitment to the admissions process. So, like, for example, if you commit to a Patriot League school, let's say you commit to Bucknell University, um, they have a slot. So that commitment is almost is the same as an acceptance. At the Ivy Leagues, you commit to the admissions process. So it's a little bit of a different situation, but regardless – there's a commitment. Um, at that point, the student athlete will tell me, you know, congratulations is in order, of course. Um, and then at that point, um, like I said, the, the kid will put it on Instagram and that all of a sudden makes it real somehow. Uh, nothing signed, you know, keep in mind that nothing is in writing until November 15th of their senior year. Now, November 15th is the early signing period. There are three signing periods throughout the year. Uh, November, April, and then June. So those three signing periods, um, those three signing days, um, is is the when you ink it, when you sign the national letter of intent. That's Division One, Division Two, and Three. Uh, also have commitments. It's just not national letter of intent. It's a little bit of a different process, but that's the first time any of this process that we've been talking about is going to be in writing. Everything else is verbal and uh, not not binding. So um, once the athlete's committed, they'll sign their letter of intent. There's typically a ceremony at Syosset High School. Uh, a number of years ago, I started uh, what we call Athlete Commitment Day, and other high schools do it as well. And, um, you know, the parents take pictures. The kid, like I said, posted on, on their social media. And, um, you know, in, in the fall, they will, will then uh, enter the university and continue their athletic career. Yeah, and that's a great day that you brought to Syosset High School many years back. That's one of my favorite uh, ceremonies to be a part of because we get to honor all of the students and their families for a long journey. You know, when we're little kids, there are hundreds of thousands of kids that play lacrosse, baseball, football, soccer, volleyball, what have you. But when you think about the percentage that make it to play in Divisions 1, 2, or 3, it's it's a tremendous commitment, you know, and you just hope that those kids, they understand that that commitment that they used on the field, that they take that same level of commitment in everything that they do throughout their lives, right? Um, so it's just a wonderful thing to be a part of, and I'm so grateful that you put that together for the high school. And again, it's a, it's, it's a pleasure to be there every year. So John, what is the follow-up with you, the family, the student athlete, and the college coach after the commitment and beyond. Yeah, I, I, that's really important um, because I personally, I really like to see how my kids are doing. You know, I mean, it, it is a long process. Um, you know, it's, you know, you just touched on it too before when you said this process typically starts for these kids today when they're in kindergarten. You know, I never <laughs> played youth sports. I started playing sports in seventh grade. When my mom wouldn't let me come home after school, she told me, you're not coming home after school. You got to go play sports. And, and, um, but these kids start in kindergarten, you know? And so this is a process when they get recruited, that's, you know, 13 years in the making. And, you know, it finally happens. They commit, they, they, they're going to continue their collegiate career. I always like to follow up. I know a lot of my colleagues, um, high school lacrosse coaches, uh, high school football coaches, high school basketball coaches, uh, you know, they all follow up with how the kids are doing, you know? So, you know, the recruitment process, I would say starts when the kids are a freshman, you know, or 10th grader. Um, but, um, you know, the, the follow-up is tremendous because this is something that I've had a relationship with these people for three years now, uh, grinding through this process. And it, it's nice, you know, it's nice to see how it turns out, you know? So, it's always there's always a follow up in that sense. Uh, I stay connected with the families, and I, I think that's really important. And what that has done is develop my relationship with the college coaches. You know, I send a kid to, you know, Cornell University, and 
you, you, I'll just give you an example. Okay. I'll say the kid's name. The kid's name was Thomas. I don't know if you remember Thomas graduated in 2011, was a hockey player, had no intentions of playing lacrosse, but his hockey career and dream of going to the NHL died when he was in 10th grade. And he reminded me of me. I was like, that's what happened to me. I was supposed to play in the NFL. I want to play for the New York Giants, you know? <laughs> and and I took this kid and I said, we're going to find a place for him. And he, and he went to Cornell. Nobody wanted him. So Thomas went to Cornell. And I called the Cornell coach and I said, look, take this kid. You're, you're not, you won't be sorry. You know, uh, it was a lot more complicated than that, but I won't, I won't get into the long, boring part of the story. But, but <laughs> the, 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 the Cornell coach, Jeff Tambroni, took him. And, and, you know, the, the, the very first week Thomas was there, Jeff said, John, I can't believe it. This is the most intense kid I've ever coached in my whole life. Long story short, Thomas was all Ivy League his sophomore year, and he was an All-American his senior year. So he made me look really good. And, and <laughs> you know, Jeff, Jeff has taken, you know, 11 – uh, excuse me, Cornell has taken Jeff. Jeff actually is the head coach at Penn State now, but it, um, Cornell took eleven more Syosset kids. You know, uh, because of uh, because, it, and each one spoke for themselves and made our place look good. You know, and it, it was something that you know that that's just how you do it. That's how you develop relationships. So I like to follow up with the student athletes because it's just good for my program. You know, and. You know the kids and parents are listening, and the coaches are listening. Who's ever listening? They, like they, they really need to understand that that follow up is important, and um, you know it, it really helps everybody involved. Well, that's great, John. And you know, I know that you've built a major network. I see the kids come back, and they all want to see Coach Calabria. And if I see them anywhere, uh, you know, at a restaurant, uh, you know, your name comes up fondly uh, amongst the student athletes, their parents. And it's just uh, awesome, man. All the great things that you've done and that you continue to do are simply awesome. So, John, to conclude, what advice do you have for parents and student athletes who are aspiring to play at the collegiate level? That's, that's the best question right there because, I mean, if one thing that I want to get across in, in, in this podcast is, is you know, I have seen this on both ends. I, I had a daughter that played was a three sport athlete at Sachem High School, where you know I, I live where I grew up, and she went on to Bucknell University to play Division One lacrosse. I have a son that was a three sport athlete. Um, he uh, is playing lacrosse at Mercy College Division Two. Um, I have a daughter that's a senior this year, and she is going to cheer at Sacred Heart University. Uh, which is actually a Division One cheer program, um, and I have a 13-year-old son. And here's my advice: Please make sure that you find the right school. Please understand that there is a tremendous amount of pressure out there that is put on all of you and all of these young kids to play Division One. Okay. Division one only. I have to play division one. That's a lot of kids will say, well, I want them to play division one. Or the parents will say, I want them to play division one. Get out of that mindset and find the right school. Make sure that you go on a visit. Make sure that you are visiting when there are students on campus and they're there. Make sure that the school is the right fit for you academically as if your leg was going to fall off tomorrow and you could never, ever play again. Because God forbid something were to happen, you want to be in the right place. You know, John, something completely crazy, like, I don't know, a global pandemic that forced you <laughs> off the field and couldn't play. Like, you know, that would never happen. But what if it did? Would the school still be the right place? And, you know, the, the I would just further say that, you know, my daughter played Division One. 6 a.m. workouts, five days a week, full regimen of lifting and training for four straight years. I know you think you're ready for that, but are you ready for that? Because no high school does that, you know. Um, are you ready for that level of commitment? Because Andrew, my son, is playing Division Two, 
and they do it two times a week instead of five times a week. They have the 6 a.m. workouts. And, you know, are you ready for that level of commitment and go to school and have family time and have a social life and work with that time management that every freshman uh, first year student in the country has to deal with because they're just not ready for it from high school. I think that it is so important to make sure that it's going to be the right fit to avoid a transfer if it's not necessary. Make sure that that you love the school. Make sure that you it is the right fit and from every aspect and don't rush into the process. You know, I think it's really important for every listener to understand that these things are 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 so important. And and you know, things I'm not even thinking of like for example, Bucknell University was 5 hours away. Mercy College is two hours away. So it's a a lot different now going to watch my son play than having to go watch my daughter play was always an overnight visit. So if you're the type of family that your whole life is wrapped in watching your son play and watching your daughter play, please just make sure that you keep geography in mind. Is it a plane ride away? Is it a car ride away? Where do they play on the Eastern Seaboard? Um, it, it's really important to look at all aspects of the recruitment. And like I said, things that we haven't even touched upon, those little nuances that are, are so important for the whole family dynamic. I really think that's, that's going to be something that you want to keep in mind. Well, John, that's excellent advice. And it's very interesting because, as you know, there have been many college admissions rep- representatives that have been interviewed on this podcast and many of the same themes are coming up in terms of fit. Do you want to be within two hours away? Are you okay with taking a plane ride? Do you want to be in an urban environment, a suburban environment? All of those things are so important, and too often people take that for granted. And I love the advice that you said because there are kids that go to a highly academic school for the purpose of playing for that school, perhaps even an Ivy League, but How did they make out when the pandemic hit, there was no season, and all of a sudden they are there, you know, dealing with the high level of academics? Just great things to consider. And it's really important to find the right school, the right fit for you, and which of course is different for every single student and is different also for every student athlete. So John, I can't thank you enough. This was an awesome conversation. And I also want to thank you because This is the kickoff to a series of episodes where we're going to be talking about college and the admissions process, but this series is going to help aspiring student athletes and their families. And I appreciate it because I know that you helped me get some of your student athletes that are currently playing in the Ivies and Divisions 1, 2, and 3, and and other student athletes that are going to come on the show. So I really appreciate your time tonight. And uh, look forward to many more conversations. Thank you so much, Coach John Calabria. Thanks, John. I really appreciate you having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend. And follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.